pleasure for us to be here with you this morning, and that for good reason, because there's a marvelous spirit that's evident among Jehovah's people, and it's evident here among his people this morning. That spirit is a reflection of the personality of our God. It's manifest in the love that exists among Jehovah's Witnesses, a love that sets us apart from the world, is separate from it. And it's shown in the joy that we manifest, a joy that's not dampened by the crises that daily force themselves on mankind. It's also reflected in the ability of Jehovah's people to get things done, and in the fact that they don't quit when the going gets hard. What it is that accounts for this spirit among Jehovah's people is beautifully described for us in the Bible book of Zechariah. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Now Zechariah was a prophet of God in Judah after the return from exile in Babylon. The temple construction had begun there in Jerusalem some 18 years before this vision that we're going to discuss in the fourth chapter. But the work on temple reconstruction had been slow. Not only had there been a putting of personal convenience ahead of the work of the Lord, but there had also been military intervention on the part of opposers of true worship there in Israel, and a ban had been imposed on the work by the Persian emperor. Well now imagine if your congregation were confronted with a situation like this. You were trying to build a kingdom hall. The work had dragged on for 18 years and it wasn't done because no one cared to do the work. They were all busy on their own homes, in their own business, looking after themselves. And when you tried to do a work, what if the community called out the militia and stopped you, and then they got an official ban on your building beside? How would you feel about the prospects for accomplishing that building of your kingdom hall? Well, that's the situation that confronted our brothers in Jerusalem at this time. God raised up his prophets Zechariah and Haggai to encourage the brothers there in Jerusalem and by means of this prophecy he showed them how the work was going to be done. Quite a remarkable description. Look at it with me. The uh, angel was speaking with Zechariah and uh, woke him up as it were because uh, he had been so involved in what he was seeing, he was as a man who was asleep. And he asked him, what are you seeing? Now down there in verse 2, he says, I have seen and look, there's a lampstand. One of these seven branch lampstands that was uh, in the temple in ancient times. I saw a lampstand, all of it of gold, with a bowl on top of it. And its seven lamps are upon it, even seven. And the lamps that are at the top of it have seven pipes. And there are two olive trees alongside it. One on the right side of the bowl and one on its left side. Well now, the very presence of the lampstand would certainly remind uh, Zechariah of the temple itself on which work needed to be done because this is where the lampstand had been found in prior times. So it let him know that this vision had something to do with that temple and obviously putting it back into operating condition again. But how was it going to be done? Did you get the answer from that description? Because that was the vision right there. And the answer is right in the picture that was painted there by Zechariah. Well, let's go on and see what he got from it. Zechariah asked the angel, verse 4, what do these things mean, my Lord? So if our reaction was, I don't get the connection, 
I don't see what that lampstand and these, these trees there have to do with building the temple. Well, we're not unlike God's prophet back there because he didn't get the point either. He described the details, but he said, I still don't see what it means. And so, starting with verse 6, he answered and said to me, This is the word of Jehovah to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by a military force, nor by power, but by my spirit, Jehovah of armies has said. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a level land, and he'll certainly bring forth the headstone, that is, the headstone of the temple. There will be shoutings to it. How charming, how charming. Because when the headstone was put in place, it meant the work was done, didn't it? But now, what was the answer he was given here? What was represented by this oil that flowed in from the trees into the lampstand? Well, he's told there in verse 6, it is God's Spirit. And that's the key to the explanation of this prophetic vision. By God's Spirit, this work would be accomplished. It's true that what lay before Zerubbabel seemed like a great mountain, just like it would seem to any one of us if for 18 years we had tried to do a job of building and it wasn't done. If they had called out the militia against us and they had an official ban against our work, it would look like a mountain, wouldn't it? If we got together and talked about it, might not someone in our midst say, brothers, is it the Lord's will that we build this place? Maybe we should be doing something else. And the brothers there felt similarly. But now they were told that this great mountain, the insurmountable object in front of them, was going to become just like a level land. That imperial ban would be no problem to them in accomplishing the work that God had set out. They didn't have to fear the army. They didn't have to muster an army to counteract the Persian army and carry on their work. No, it would not be by military force, nor by power, political power or otherwise, but by my spirit, Jehovah of armies has said. All the political and military power of that day could not stop the accomplishment of God's purpose. And his spirit began to work. And how it worked was remarkable. Jehovah's prophets urged Zerubbabel and the high priest, Joshua, to get on with the work. Start the building. Don't worry about the enemy. Don't worry about the enemy ban. It doesn't amount to anything because a higher lawgiver has said, do the work. And if Jehovah says, do the work, what man says doesn't amount to a thing. So they got on with the work. But promptly, the opposers came in, checked out what was going there, going on there, and said, now what is this? And they gave them a firm, positive answer, and instead of enforcing the imperial decree, now remember, a ban had been put on this work. The law evidently was on the side of the opposers, but instead of enforcing it, the opposers, for some apparently unaccountable reason, said that they would check with the emperor. And they sent a delegate all the way down to the seat of the Persian Empire, far to the east, a trip that took months in those days by foot to find out whether it was all right to go ahead with the work. Well, in the meantime, the brothers got busy and got that building going up, got things accomplished. But now, what would happen when the inquiry got back there to the emperor that an imperial ban was being defied. Well, instead of letting pride well up and saying that the government is being defied, he said, check the archives and see if there's anything on this. Now, very unlike most men in power, but they checked the archives and he found from many, many years ago that there was a decree there from Cyrus, one of his predecessors, not his immediate predecessor, but several back, who had said that the Jews should go back and build that house of Jehovah in Jerusalem. So he told these inquirers not only to go back and let them build the house, but he said, don't you interfere with what they're doing. And furthermore, 
You give them help. Take resources, money, supplies that belong to the empire, and you give it to them to see that that house of Jehovah is built in harmony with the decree here. But now, what could account for a thing like this? So contrary to human experience, so contrary to the way that human rulers are often so prone to act. It's only one thing. It wasn't military might. It wasn't political influence. But it was God's spirit that was at work. And it was God's spirit that continued to work until that temple was completed and the headstone was put in place in the month Adar of 1515 before the common era. Going on now with verse 8 in this same chapter, the account continues, And the word of Jehovah continued to occur to me, saying, The very hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his own hands will finish it. And you will have to know that Jehovah of armies himself has sent me to you people. For who has despised the day of small things? It was a small beginning that they had. And they will certainly rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, the plummet for measuring the house, to see that it was true when the last block was put in place and the work was complete. These seven are the eyes of Jehovah. His eyes in their completeness, all seven, spiritual completeness, heavenly completeness, all his attention would be focused on that work until they came, it came to its completion. They are roving about those eyes in all the earth to see that his work is done. But now, what were the details of that vision seen earlier? Verse 11 asks, what do these two olive trees on the right side of the lampstand and on the left side mean? And after some exchange between him and the angelic messenger in verse 14, he's told, These are the two anointed ones who are standing alongside the Lord of the whole earth. Two anointed ones were there in Judah. The governor, Zerubbabel, and Jeshua, the high priest. And as long as they stayed close to Jehovah, and had his mind in connection with true worship and worked in harmony with his will, then the nation would be just like that lampstand as if it had two olive trees for an oil supply that pumped the oil in and kept the lampstand illuminated and thus kept the nation infused with the Spirit of God to accomplish that work in connection with the reconstruction of the temple. You see why I said it was a beautiful description, isn't it? So meaningful, the details there, so marvelous. And all of it directing attention back to whom? To the Lord of the whole earth. Close to whom Zerubbabel and Joshua had to stay if they were to have his spirit and to accomplish that work of temple rebuilding. Well, now, we've discussed this this morning because it's very significant to us. Significant concerning the time in which we live. It involves events from the restoration of, cap to, uh, from, the restoration from captivity of God's people in the year 1919 on down through to the time when true worship will be brought to a perfected state at Jehovah's spiritual temple. It deals with that time leading up to the point when the old system with its false religion will be gone. When, as a result of the operation of God's spirit, the only ones left here on earth will those be those who worship at that spiritual temple, the anointed remnant and the great crowd of their associates. It points to the time when the full-scale worship of Jehovah is restored with all the under-priests serving there in the temple and 
with the headstone, the Lord Jesus Christ in position as God's acting royal high priest. So what this is describing is the events from 1919 through our day on to the other side of the Great Tribulation, and it's telling us how God's work in connection with his temple would be accomplished in this time. Yes. Now, we're in the picture then, aren't we? And this is a picture that we need to understand so that we act in full harmony with it and we appreciate that what is being done is of God and not simply due to human ingenuity, human organizational ability, or contacts that some individuals may have with persons in the old system of things. Jehovah has standing next to him the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is represented by the two olive trees. Why two? Well, because of the two roles that he occupies. Governor, he is our ruler, isn't he? And high priest, and he is that. He was represented by both Zerubbabel and high priest, Joshua. And in this dual role, he stands alongside or close to Jehovah, the heavenly Lord of all the earth, and through him, Holy Spirit flows into that which is represented by the lampstand, the spiritual nation, the Christian congregation with which we're associated. It's infused with God's Spirit, and by means of that Spirit, accomplishes God's work in connection with true worship. And what's been done? Well, I'd like to just review a few things that are really a delight to the heart of God's people and that show how true this is. You know from your reading of the Society's publications that at the end of World War II, God's people were as dead in the streets as described in the book of Revelation. Enemies had been successful in sending the officials of the Watchtower Society to prison with long prison terms over their head. They weren't too far away from here, up in Atlanta Penitentiary. But just as the Jews in ancient times were liberated from exile in Babylon, so these spiritual Israelites in modern time were liberated. The officials of the society were freed from prison and again the work got underway. But our brothers had a question, very much as did Zerubbabel and those with him. In view of the opposition and the pressure they faced, what really was God's will? Was there still preaching work to be done? Did anyone else want to hear the good news? Or had they all been gathered at that time? Well, Brother Rutherford made a trip out to Los Angeles in connection with his health because it had been badly damaged by his months in prison and the effects of it stayed with him the rest of his life. But while he was there in Los Angeles, though very ill, he had to find out what God's will was in connection with the work being done here on earth. And so he hired a large auditorium, much larger than they thought would be filled. And he thought, now we're going to advertise a meeting here. And we're going to tell them that the ones who are sponsoring this meeting are men that the government sent to jail a little while ago. And we're going to see if anybody wants to listen to something like this. And what happened on that occasion? When the meeting began, the brothers looked around and they saw something like you see here this morning. Because the auditorium was packed. Right up to the walls it was packed. And outside the door, there were hundreds that couldn't get in. And they told those outside, all right, we'll have another meeting later for you. And so they packed out the auditorium once and they filled it half again for the second meeting. They hadn't really thought that they could do it once. Now, what was God telling them? What was his spirit directing the brothers to do? Well, they took the message to be, there's work to be done, and God is with you. Get to it. Not long after this, the question arose among the brothers, should we go back to the Bethel home 
in New York. Is this the Lord's will? Well, how could they tell? What would they do? Perhaps you remember that Gideon, centuries ago, was given a commission by God, and he wanted to make sure that this messenger who appeared to him really was from God and that the work was something God would back up because he was being given a job that from human standpoint was impossible. So Gideon took a fleece and laid it out and asked that one night it be filled with dew and the ground around it be dry and that the next night there be no dew on that fleece but the ground around it have moisture on it. He says, now if that happens, I know that God has a hand in it. And it happened. And Gideon got the message and he went out and carried out his assignment. What did our brothers do back there in 1919? Well, Brother Wise, the vice president of the society, was talking to Brother Rutherford, who was then the president of the Watchtower Society, and asked him, what should we do? Well, Brother Rutherford said, it was a failure to get coal supplies in 1918 that drove us from Brooklyn back to Pittsburgh. So let's make coal the test. Now coal was rationed then. You couldn't get what you wanted. You had to wait. And even then you just got a small portion. So I, he said, go and order some coal, Brother Wise. Let's see if we get it. Brother Wise said, how many tons should we order to make the test? Well, Brother Rutherford said, let's make it a good test. Order 500 tons. Now, Bethel back then was just a big house. It wasn't the Bethel you see today. You imagine ordering 500 tons of coal for just a big house. Now, go down to the, the government board and say you want 500 tons of coal and see what's going to happen. Well, it's obvious that... Uh, <laughs> There's got to be something at work beyond you to get that 500 tons. Our brothers went down and requested the 500 tons and immediately were given the certificate for it. <laughs> Brother Wise contacted Brother Rutherford and he says they're going to give it to us. What do we do with it all now? Well, he said, accept it and convert the basement into coal bins. So they took the whole basement of the house and started fixing up coal bins and they had that 500 tons of coal for a long time after that before they got it used up. But what was the message? What was the point? The point was they had made a test to see what the will of God was. And it was only a short time later that our brothers moved back into Brooklyn Bethel. And anyone who visits there today would have no doubt as they look around that that surely was the Lord's will for his people. It was a day of small things back then. Our brothers in that year, 1919, started to publish the Golden Age. Just a few thousand copies because there weren't many of them. But things have grown since then. And today, the Watchtower and Awake magazines published by the Watchtower Society are two of the most widely circulated magazines of any kind, secular or religious, in all the earth because God's Spirit has been upon his people. Of course, when you do printing, you have to do fact. You have to have factories to work with. And in 1922, the Society obtained a factory there in Brooklyn, already built, moved into it on Concord Street, and to get set up for the work that needed to be done, they obtained a complete outfit of typesetting, electroplating, printing, and binding equipment. But now, put yourself in this position. What if you're an individual who by trade is not a printer, and you're not a bookbinder, and you're not an electroplater, and you just went out and you bought all this brand new equipment to carry on this work? What are you going to do with it? Well, the president of a printing firm came into the society's pr premises and uh, he toured it and he saw all this equipment here and uh, he knew the brothers there at Bethel because they had had business contacts before and his comment was this. 
here you are with a first class printing establishment on your hands and nobody around the place that knows a thing about what to do with it. In six months, the whole thing will be just a lot of junk. But he didn't know the prophecy of Zechariah. He never heard about that lampstand and those two olive trees. And if he read it, he probably wouldn't have understood it anyway. But the answer to how that factory was going to operate was there in the book of Zechariah because God's spirit on his people could enliven their minds so that they could do things that in times past perhaps they haven't been trained for. And they have. Those of you who have visited Bethel know what's there. It's not a factory filled with a lot of junk, is it? It's one of the biggest printing establishments in the United States today and carrying on a work that's far more important than that carried on in other, any other printing establishment. Today, it's not uncommon for worldly businessmen to come into the society's factory to tour it and uh, to ask as they watch the brothers and watch the zeal they have in their work and uh, to learn of the production that comes out of that factory and to observe the efficiency with which it's done. Their question is, how much do you pay men to get them to work like this? And the one who's taking them on tour says, well, they receive an allowance of $14 a month beside their room and board. And the man laughs. Invariably, he laughs. He says, you must be kidding. It's obvious. It's not the money that's bringing the reaction. What is it? It's what's described there in the book of Zechariah. That uh, that which is represented by the oil, God's spirit is channeled down into that lampstand, the Christian congregation, and it illuminates it. And it makes things work and gets things done. And we certainly have experienced that at Bethel. When the work got going back in 1919, there were only a handful of them, and of course, a big work to be done. The question is, how would it be done? Well, in 1922, our brothers started to use the radio. Now, obviously, that would be effective because one person could reach many that way, couldn't they? And it's interesting, as you read the New Year book, to uh, find that in those early days, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was the organization that was having larger chains of radio stations than anyone else in their day. The President of the United States wasn't using bigger radio chains to talk. The King of England wasn't using greater radio chains to talk to people. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was. Why? Well, not because of who was speaking for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, but because of the connections. And what were the connections? Not political connections, but they were connections that went back through those symbolic olive trees to the one who was the Lord of the whole earth. And even though there were just a handful of humans with limited financial means, surely the Lord of the whole earth could open things up, couldn't he? And he did, so that the good news got preached far and wide back even in those early days. But uh, along in the mid-30s, God's Spirit got working in another direction to accomplish his work. Jehovah raised up something better than available radio stations. He be began to raise up more people he himself had had them described in the book of Revelation as a great crowd that no man could number. Now God's Spirit began to work on them, not like it had worked on the anointed to beget them to heavenly life. But nonetheless, that Spirit that was flowing from the Lord of the whole earth was obviously reaching them because of their association with that new nation of spiritual Israel. And it infused them to go to work, and with the same attitude that their anointed brothers had. A spirit that made them demonstrate love, joy, determination to get a work done, and fearlessness to stick with it despite opposition. And what's happened since 1935? 
Well, the preaching of the good news has moved out into over 200 lands around the earth. And it hasn't always been easy. There have been bans, destruction of kingdom halls, great opposition that have been met by both the anointed and their other sheep companions where they serve. Now, just as an example, in Zambia, there are many of our brothers today. In fact, so many of them that our brothers in that country number about one to every 80 or 85 of the population. Did you know that? But they got to be so many that evidently the uh, politicians got nervous. And uh, it was a little awkward to do something about this because uh, after all, the, uh, on the government level, almost everybody had a relative who was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, now what are you going to do when your relatives are in this? But still they decided they were going to do something from an official standpoint, and while not totally banning the work of Jehovah's Witnesses, they prohibited their house-to-house -house preaching of the good news. All right, now, what would you do if that happened in your congregation territory? What if it happened here in the United States? What would you do? Well, our brothers in Zambia figured that uh, maybe you can't go from house to house working every house down the street, but uh, that doesn't mean you can't go to one house here and visit somebody and maybe walk a couple blocks and visit somebody you know over there, does it? So it doesn't have to be from one house to the very next house, but there are other ways you can visit people. And evidently our brothers have found ample ways to visit people and spending a little more time with them than they were in times past. This last year in Zambia, our brothers conducted 50,000 home Bible studies. That's about one Bible study for every publisher in the country. Now would you say that the ban stopped the work? Well, what is it that makes it go? What makes it go is what's described there in Zechariah. Yes, but in those 11 lands, it's interesting to observe that there are 172,000 active witnesses. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that our brothers are not cowed by official opposition. It makes no difference when the government says, you're outlawed. You cannot carry on the worship of your God. It does not stop them when they're told, you cannot preach to others about these things that you believe, because they look to the one who is the Lord of the whole earth. And from him, his spirit comes down with greater strength than any political party or any military force. And as a result, last year, our 172,000 brothers in these lands spent over 18 million hours in preaching the good news in their territory where they're told you can't do it. And last year, 16,200 of our new brothers and sisters came into the truth where they're told you can't be Jehovah's Witnesses. Isn't that marvelous? the military might and political power in the earth cannot stop the accomplishment of the will of the one who is the Lord of all the earth, Jehovah our God. A marvelous example of how that spirit works in God's people is seen in the activity of our brothers in Japan. Recently, Brother Barry, the branch overseer there, was visiting New York and he told us about a congregation from which they received a report before he left. A congregation that reported that they had 40 regular pioneers one month. Think of that. 40 regular pioneers. They had 40 temporary pioneers that month. That made 80. They had 40 congregation publishers. And they put a note on their report that the 40 congregation publishers were not on the pioneer rolls because they were so new that they had not yet been baptized. So everyone who could be in the pioneer work was in the pioneer work that month 
in their congregation. And what response were they getting to this zeal on their part? Well, the 120 reported that they were running over 300 at their meetings. And they told the branch, we're having a problem. We're also new here in the truth that in our midst we only have one brother who's an elder. We appreciate his services very much, but we have over 300 here and we need to do something and we only have one elder. And so the branch arranged to send in another brother who is an elder to that congregation to help out. And what did they do? Well, they promptly divided the congregation because now they had one elder for each congregation and they could take care of more newly interested persons. And how are they able to do this? You, you hear about all these people pioneering and you say, my life must be different over there. It's not because the economic situation is easier. Do you know that last year in Japan, the inflation rate was double what it is in the United States? Now, if we have found it hard to go shopping for groceries, our sisters in Japan have found it twice as hard to get the groceries for their families. And yet, over 25% of the publishers in Japan are in the pioneer work. It's a marvelous example. They, they feel the urgency of the work and they're putting themselves into it. Now, just to illustrate the obstacles that some of them have overcome, one young housewife in Kyoto wanted to get into the pioneer work, but she had a husband who was bitterly opposed. In fact, he was an elder in the Protestant church, and he didn't like what his wife was doing. She also had a very sickly child that required her time. She saw her responsibilities, but she wanted to do more in the active field work. She decided, first, I need to help my husband. How? by working on myself. Preaching to him isn't going to be the answer, but perhaps if to a greater extent I give evidence that God's Spirit is working in my life, it will open his heart. And so she became a very diligent housewife and was very careful in the way she dealt with her husband to do it in a truly Christian manner. And what was the result? her husband came into the truth and joined her in the pioneer work when she was able to get into the pioneer work. But now what about that child? Well, she started out to build the youngster up and took the child along in the field service just a little while at a time so as not to impair its health, but added to it a little more and a little more. And you know, as is often the case when there's Exercise, activity, and fresh air, health improves, doesn't it? And the child's health improved to the point where the mother could go out and put in pioneer time and it helped the health of that child. So now she and her husband are in the pioneer work. The youngster can go along with the mother for full days in the field service and that sister has had the grand blessing of aiding seven persons to come to the point of baptism and her husband who studies with the unbelieving husbands in the congregation has helped ten of them to come to the point of baptism. Why? Because God's Spirit is active in the lives of His people. That same Spirit is evident at Bethel in Brooklyn. We know you brothers are keenly interested in what goes on there and we see it regularly. At Bethel, it's not at all uncommon for chartered buses to be parked out front. It's not uncommon to see folks come through that came in on a chartered plane from anywhere in the United States. These are regular occurrences because our brothers are interested in Bethel. And among those who go on tour are some who have been in the truth for many years but never been there before. And when they go through Bethel, their reaction is that they're thrilled. And it was worth every bit of effort and expense on their part to get there and see with their own eyes what's being done at headquarters. But among those who have come on tour have also been quite a few unbelieving family members. 
sometimes a marriage mate, sometimes a teenage son or daughter who came along with believing parents. And it has been interesting to hear what has happened as a result of their tour of Bethel. Not a lot of preaching, but just looking around for themselves. They always kind of had in the back of their mind that somebody's making a fistful of money out of this. And when they got down there and saw for themselves how it worked and asked the tour guides their questions, and it wasn't their wife who was doing all the preaching, but they were getting it from somewhere else, they began to realize it's so. This isn't just my wife and a few others of these witnesses in the neighborhood. This is an amazing organization. And they've gone home and started to attend meetings, started to study with one of the local brothers, and we're very happy when we hear that those individuals have come to be numbered among Jehovah's servants. Among the things you hear from Bethel these days are about expansion there. I know you've read in Kingdom Ministry about uh, new presses coming in and other equipment. You may wonder, well, why? Well, you know from your yearbook how many were baptized last year, don't you? 297,000. It's an amazing figure. But it's, it's such a big figure that maybe it doesn't register. Let me ask this. Uh, how many of you here in the audience this morning were present in 1958 at the convention in Yankee Stadium in the Polo Grounds. Would you raise your hands? Well, that's fine. Thank you very much. There are quite a few, and that's good to see. But now, do you remember at the public talk at Yankee Stadium in the Polo Grounds, do you remember looking around and seeing that tremendous sea of faces, not only the regular seating area filled with the bleachers and, and even the grass filled with thousands sitting on it, you remember hearing the announcement that the, the other stadium was also packed to the hill and that on the sidewalk outside were tens of thousands who hadn't been able to get in and that they had loudspeakers out there so that they could hear the program. You remember that? Does the picture come back to you? Last year, more than that number got baptized. There were 44,000 more. Well, all of them want Bibles. They want the aid book. They want the other books for study. They want the magazines. And after they read them for a few months, now they want to get out in field service. And that means they want a whole lot more to take to other people. Where are they going to come from? Well, it takes enough new equipment in one year to take care of what used to be the whole organization not many years ago. So the society has arranged to obtain six more large rotary presses that are on order, even though we already have 40 there in Brooklyn and 10 of them up at the Watchtower Farm that are running. They've also uh, arranged to obtain this large new book press that turns out 40 million books a year. Remember reading about that in Kingdom Ministry and Already we have 10 bindery lines that are running two shifts day and, and night. We have the bindery going and they're turning out approximately 300,000 bound books on a day and night shift, which is a tremendous quantity of literature. But although we have 10 lines, six more lines have been ordered to take care of the needs that may arise. And some of our brothers ask themselves, why? Now, I see what happened last year, and I understand things up to this point. But, you know, this is the end of 1974. And, brother, 1975 is just a few weeks away, isn't it? Now, is somebody up there losing faith? No, not at all. The society very much believes the end is near. But they're not trying to second guess the Lord. And the information that's come through from the Lord of the whole earth with the flow of that Holy Spirit into the symbolic lampstand 
is not included any notification of the day and the hour. The information that came through by means of Holy Spirit is recorded in the Bible and it says, you don't know the day and the hour. And it tells us pointedly that at a time that you do not think to be it, it comes. So the society is not trying to act like it knows more than the Lord said his people would know. Because if they did, they wouldn't fit the description of God's servants in this time of the end. Rather, they're working with appreciation for what the Lord said they should do. And what's that? Preach. Preach this good news of the kingdom. So if more equipment was needed last year, obviously more is going to be needed this year. And so what? If all that equipment got installed and got running, and as a result of spending all that money to get those presses in, what if the literature got off that enabled just one more person to come in the truth that would not have learned it otherwise? Would you say that it was worth a million dollars for that press? And even if it should be that all the equipment that is ordered isn't delivered before the great tribulation comes, so what? Wouldn't it be better to be going full steam ahead when the end comes than to have quit a half a year too early and have the Lord ask, and what do you think you're doing? <laughs> God's people want to be found faithful when that time comes whether it's in 1974 or 75 or 76 or beyond. He hasn't told us the day or the hour. We know that this generation that saw these things begin back in 1914 will see the end, but he hasn't give us, given us a cutting off place. Who is it that's doing all this work, this preaching and the work at Bethel? Well, people like you and me, not necessarily people who have a lot of ability, but people who are willing. That was true when the tabernacle was built out in the wilderness. They were people who had been slaves for years, brought out, and now here they were to build a glorious tabernacle with all kinds of work involving gold. What had they been doing up till this point? Making bricks for Pharaoh? What do you learn about delicate gold work, making bricks, working down in a slime pit? God's Spirit made it possible for them to construct that tabernacle according to the pattern that he provided. In the first century, the real spiritual temple came into existence. And there were those who were doing work in connection with gathering together the under priests who would serve in that spiritual temple. The Apostle Paul was one of such. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, he explains very clearly how the work got accomplished back then. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, not that we of ourselves are adequately qualified to reckon anything as issuing from ourselves, but our being adequately qualified issues from God and how true that is. But it's his spirit at work in the lives of his people that accomplishes the work in connection with his great spiritual temple. Recently, Brother Gangus was presiding at the table at Bethel as he has been every 10 weeks as a member of the governing body and he related something that made us appreciate the truthfulness of this. Brother Gangus, years ago, when the Theocratic Ministry School began at Bethel, knew that he wasn't much of a speaker, and he uh, rather shuddered at this idea of a Theocratic Ministry School, and his first reaction was, that's not for me. You're not going to get me to sign up for it. And that's what he said. But uh, he thought about it, and nobody made him sign up for it. But Brother Gangus wanted to be a useful servant to Jehovah, and 
as he saw things get underway, he decided he'd better sign up too, and he did. He got in the uh, ministry school there at Bethel and then out in the congregation, and as he said that, mo that morning when he was relating the experience, he says that amazing things happen when you make yourself available for Jehovah's service. He says, look where I'm sitting this morning, at the head of the Bethel table, as a member of the governing body. Jehovah's Spirit works wonderfully, even on those who feel they can't do it, if they're just willing and make themselves available. And we were told there at the Bethel table that the governing body has recently been expanded by eight members. There were 11, and Brother Sullivan died not long ago. It brought the number down to 10. But uh, this past month, on November 28th, announcement was made of the addition of eight more anointed brothers to the governing body. One of them, interestingly, from England. Another from Japan. One of them has been teaching in the Kingdom Ministry School and also had the experience that goes with raising a family. Another one has been serving up at Watchtower Farm. Others have been members of the Bethel family for a number of years. One of them is a circuit overseer who has been serving recently in New Jersey. And it's been very interesting to, to us to see the body broaden out and include individuals with diverse backgrounds whose experience in life will be very beneficial to Jehovah's entire visible organization. Some persons, of course, may admire the organization, but they're not a part of it. And frankly, they feel that God wouldn't want them. They have lived very much as a part of the world in the past. Maybe a member of the families in the truth, or friends are. Once in a while I'll go to a meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses, but doesn't go much farther. Really, they just feel that they can't make the changes that are needed to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not that they don't agree with you, Really, they feel your standards are much higher than theirs, but uh, they just can't see themselves in your position. But uh, as these individuals get to know God better, their viewpoint toward who he's willing to have changes. Because they get to reading the Christian Greek scriptures and they find out that the Apostle Paul wasn't always a saint. In fact, he had a pretty bad background. He had accountability for some blood on his hands, didn't he? Christian blood before he accepted the truth. But God didn't say, I don't want a fellow like that. Don't bother to talk to him. No, he became the Apostle Paul. Moses was one who, Simon, <laughs> Moses argued with the Lord that he couldn't talk and Jehovah just about bawled Moses out to tell him, look Moses, I made man's mouth and I know how it works. Now go and do the work I gave you to do. <laughs> Moses learned how to talk. Over in Italy, there's a man who used to be a lieutenant in the mafia, the Sicilian mafia, that came in touch with one of Jehovah's Witnesses when this man was serving time in prison. And now is a man with a background like that going to change? He did. And he's conducting Bible studies with men in prison now. So notable has been his change of life that they interviewed him on national television over there because the people knew him. They knew him for his background and they let him see what this man was doing in prison today as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Some of you are acquainted with the fact that in Angola Penitentiary in Louisiana, 
There are a number of men who were there as convicts because of their criminal life who have learned the truth and have become baptized witnesses and are now serving Jehovah under their circumstances where they find the penitentiary who have changed their lives to be found acceptable to God. But now don't draw the wrong conclusion. God isn't saying, I take anybody the way he is. No. He accepts anyone regardless of what his former life was. If his heart moved him to repent and turn around. But now, how is the change made? How does it happen? Well, it's God's Spirit that brings it. It is not. But we have to open ourselves to the flow of that Spirit. Where does it operate? Well, remember in Zechariah, it describes those olive trees, and they were connected with that, that lampstand, which represents the Christian congregation, God's nation of spiritual Israel. Well, a person has to be in association with that because he wants to be. And now he's in where that spirit works. And now it can begin to make a change, to illustrate. In Argentina, with a young man who lacked proper training, he was living with a woman without benefit of marriage, and so frustrated was he by life that this fella gave himself over to the bottle. Now, I shouldn't just say the bottle, I should say the bottle, because he used to drink four to six bottles of wine and liquor every day. I just think what that would do to a man's liver. Four to six bottles of it every day. And then he got himself involved in spiritism on top of it. What a mess his life was in. But the woman he was living with began to study the truth and finally persuaded him to go along to the kingdom hall and reluctantly he went. Got acquainted with the brothers and they managed to get a study going with him so that God's inspired word could start working in his life and help the man because he wanted something better, but he couldn't do it himself. Study helped. But uh, finally, when the brother learned that this man was having trouble with spiritism, and he studied the chapter, Are There Wicked Spirits? And the man saw it, and he got things out of his life that were connection with spiritism. Now things really began to open up, and there was progress. The impediment to the flow of the spirit was beginning to get cleaned out. And now he started to attend the meetings in the Kingdom Hall, and he knew he needed it. And he began to realize the value of it to the extent that this man went to every meeting of the congregation, and because there were two congregations meeting in the Kingdom Hall, he attended every meeting of both congregations every week over a considerable period of time. And what do you think started to happen in his life? The spiritism cleaned out, the drunkenness cleaned out, the desire for the liquor disappeared so that he didn't have the fight. He cleaned up his life morally, got married to the woman with whom he was living, got baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He and his wife, temporary pioneer, and are working towards being in the regular pioneer work. This is because they opened the way for the operation of God's Spirit in their lives. And if there is anyone who looks at Jehovah's people and says, they're a fine people, I admire you, but I couldn't be one of them. Well, stop and think. What does it take to be one of them? It doesn't take your might, your strength. It takes your opening yourself to the operation of God's Spirit and you'll bring the changes if you want that change to be made. But a marvelous thing Jehovah does on behalf of mankind. <laughs> that change, of course, shouldn't stop when we get to the point of dedication and baptism, and it won't if we apply the counsel of God's Word for us. Proverbs chapter 4 says something very noteworthy for us, something we ought to think about individually. Proverbs chapter 4, 
And in the midst of verse 4, the statement begins, May your heart keep fast hold of my word. Keep my commandments and continue living. Did you notice what got the attention in that verse? It's the heart. We may learn things when we go to our congregation meetings. They get into our head. But to get into our heart, we have to do something after the meeting or before the meeting. And if we don't, even what we learn does not make a change in our lives. What does it take to reach our heart? It takes appreciative meditation. It takes going back over the things we've learned and asking ourselves, what does that mean to me and what can I do with it? Do we do that after we attend our meeting? Is it a part of our lives or is it just once in a while when we feel something reaches our heart? The Bible says, may your heart keep fast hold of my word. And verse 5 continues, Acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Do not forget and do not turn aside from the things of my mouth. What does it mean? Does that mean be sure you're smart? That's not what that verse is saying. It doesn't say simply get knowledge. We need that. It says, acquire wisdom. You know, there are some people who have comparatively little in the way of knowledge who have greater wisdom than those who have much knowledge. How is that? Because wisdom is the ability to use in a right way the things we learn. And now this means that when we study and we learn something, the question in our mind should be, how could I use it? It isn't just, it's interesting, but what should I be doing with it? Should it be changing my life? Is there somebody I should talk to about it? What's the import of this? Do we do that with what we learn? Do we also get understanding, as that verse says? And what is that? Well, the proverb also says that the fear of the Most Holy One is what understanding is. Understanding means seeing the connection between what we learn and God, the Lord of the whole earth. Now, if we stop and think about what we learn and ask, how does that affect my relationship with God? Oh, now we're opening the way for that flow of the Holy Spirit, aren't we? Instead of quenching it and stifling it and saying, I see what it says, but I'm not going to let it change me. Do you see the difference? Do we understand what wisdom, what understanding are, and how we get them? It's simply a matter of what we do with our mind. It isn't a matter of being so smart. It's a matter of asking ourselves, how can I use this? What effect should it have on my life? How does it affect my relationship with God? Anybody can ask himself those questions, can't it? And when our mind gets working in that direction, Jehovah with his spirit is going to help us to find the answer. Have we been doing that, for example, with the things that we've learned in recent years and months in the publication? For example, in recent years, something has been brought to our attention in connection with the ransom. It was first in 1965 that it was pointed out. It was a couple years ago. It was highlighted again in the Watchtower. Something that represented a change in thinking. Did we get it? Do you know what the change was? Well, the point was the difference between the ransom value of Jesus' sacrifice and its sin atoning value. Now maybe that seems just like a technicality in one of the Watchtowers but it makes a big difference to our viewpoint on things. How? Well, because the ransom, as was explained, 
applies to all mankind, all the offspring of Adam. They're all purchased with one act that was performed when the ransom was paid. The offspring of Adam were purchased, and the way was open for them to gain life. All mankind purchased. The sin atoning value, on the other hand, which is necessary to gain eternal life, applies only to those who exercise faith. But the ransom applies to them if they've exercised faith or not, up to the point where there's a complete repudiation of it. One of our sisters in Honduras obviously got the point of this, and her thinking was affected when the hurricane, Hurricane Fiji, went through there a short time ago and devastated the northeast coast of the land. There were eight to 10,000 people who lost their lives. Whole villages were wiped out, homes just swept away, and you couldn't even tell the house was there afterwards. Just smooth sand or dirt because everything was buried underneath or swept out to sea. This particular sister, however, had a home built up on stilts. And as the community was being swept away, she threw open her door to her neighbors and began to pack them in, a couple hundred of them. She wasn't rich. She didn't have a big house, not bigger than houses you have. Imagine having a couple hundred people in your house. She got a couple hundred people into her humble home because she knew their lives depended on getting out of the floodwaters and up into her dwelling. But she had a neighbor over there, a neighbor that hated her because she was a witch. But this sister knew that that neighbor who hated her had been purchased with the ransom. And that affects how you look at people. Do you think, them, think of them as someone who isn't interested in the truth, they must be a ghost? Or do you think of them as someone who was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, this sister, in the height of the storm, showing how she felt about it, tied a rope around her waist, waded over to her neighbor's house, pounded on the door until she came out. The woman wouldn't come with her. Finally, she handed her her young child and said, take the child with you. And the sister took the child back to her house and loaded that one into the house and went back and ripped that door open and went in and pleaded with the woman, come, and took her, took her back to her home, up to safety, so that her life would be preserved that night. Now, what effect do you think this would have on that woman? How is a person going to feel when they realize that you put their life ahead of your own. That their life is that precious. Now that's what Jesus Christ did when he laid down his life for mankind. Well, that sister made good use of that night with 200 people who weren't brothers and sisters in her home, telling them about the marvelous hope of the kingdom. But what opened the way for it? It was an understanding of this point covered in the watchtower on the ransom. She got the sense of it. Have we? Recently we studied something about administration. Ephesians 1 verse 10. Did we get it? Can we all explain it now? Some heads nod as if maybe we had a little struggle with that. One thing you know, it's not the kingdom, right? It said that in so many words. But it's a way of doing things. Now what does that mean? A way of doing things that results in unity. Unity with whom? Well, with the one who's represented by those two olive trees first, but mainly with the Lord of the whole earth, Jehovah God. And what is the point of this about administration? I'm not going to go into all the details again, you just studied it. But the point is that this administration began back at Pentecost of the year 33. The administration has been underway for over 1900 years ago. And this administration is the thing that makes changes in the lives of people so that no longer do they repel one another. No longer do they look down on one another. No longer are people of another race unacceptable to them. 
no longer do they feel that their nationality is superior to that of another nationality. Now remember, this way of doing things of God that brings about this change in the lives of people began 1900 years ago. Now if it began 1900 years ago, and it's been an operation for all of our lives, there's a clue in that for us. And what is it? That it ought to be having an effect, shouldn't it? And changes should be taking place in our lives. And we cannot adopt the view that after the Great Tribulation, things are going to be different. Then I'm going to be a different person. Right now, forgive me, I've got a violent temper. I know you don't like it, but that's the way I am, and you just got to live with it. It'll be easier later. Oh? Maybe we need to go back and study that information on the administration. God didn't say after the Great Tribulation I'm going to put in operation an administration that will bring changes in here. What he said is I put into operation an administration 1900 years ago and it ought to be working by now. And what makes it work? Opening our lives to the flow of God's Spirit. As simple as that. If the change isn't taking place, why are we choking it off? Don't we study? Don't we go to meetings? Are we neglectful of prayer? Examine the line. Check what's going on. What would you do if you turned on the faucet in your house and no water came out? You'd get the thing checked out so it would get to flowing again, wouldn't you? Well, now, if you want God's Spirit to flow in your life, let's check out the line and find out where things got plugged up so that that administration has effect in our lives. <laughs> We've also studied quite a bit in recent times about conscience. You notice our study of conscience started our study of the heart. Why? Because the, function, the functioning of the conscience depends on the heart. Yes, we don't pay attention to what Proverbs said about the heart, our conscience isn't going to work right. And if our conscience isn't going to work right, then when we're told that a certain decision, a certain matter, is up to your conscience, your Christian conscience, our attitude on that will be, well, I see. In other words, you do it one way and I do it another. It's all a matter of the way you look at it, and it really isn't that important because the Bible doesn't come right out and say it, right? Wrong. If that's the way it works, in our mind, our heart hasn't been opened. Because the conscience involves the interplay between the heart and the mind. And since it involves an interplay between the heart and the mind, when a question is put to us that involves a decision of conscience, what it really means is you're being confronted not with a situation where someone else makes the decision for you, brother, but now this is the acid test of whether you're really a Christian. You, you know what you've heard at the meeting. You know what the Bible says. You know what you've read at the, in the society's publications. So the question that confronts you now, brother, is what's in your heart? Have you really implanted in your heart the things that you've learned? If you have, you'll make the right decision. That's what it means when we're told it's up to your conscience. Did we get that message when we studied it? Well, we want to be sure that we do because it indicates we're getting wisdom and understanding. Now this morning, too, we're going to have a discussion of the current watchtower. It's going to involve the application of the ark of Noah's day, what that ark represents, and we are going to observe in there something that's new that we're learning in this issue of the Watchtower. And uh, as we learn it, as we listen to the comments given by our brothers and sisters, let's make sure that not only our mind is functioning, let's get the flow open to our hearts and uh, remember those questions we need to ask. How can I use this? 
what difference does it make in my life? How does it affect my relationship with God? And if you look at it this way, I think you'll find our study this morning is going to be a marvelously beneficial one for all of us. So now let's turn our attention back to the chairman and we'll consider that portion of the program.